like contrast 231 and the crib where you could come in, have a conversation, hang out, but that's not what you know as it is today. As today, there's any type of coffee that you could imagine. There's refreshers, there's cappuccinos, all these kind of things. And in 1971, in their first store, they only had black coffee that you could get. They sold like tea, spices, and all these kinds of things in bags, but you could only get one coffee. It was 25 cents, and today it's about a Howard Schultz walked into their first store in Seattle, saw it and loved it, and he went on the trip out east and went from there. He went worldwide. He didn't really keep the original feel of the coffee shop. It's more so like a drive through coffee shop now compared to what it used to be, but it's great for those going to work, going home, going to their class, all those types of things. So I was in charge of the environmental analysis um, the first thing that we look at is the economic side of it. So one threat that um, Starbucks has faced within the last few years is the rise in uh, wages of coffee producing com uh, countries. Uh, they source almost, I'm pretty sure it's 100% of their coffee beans from South America. And uh, I mean, it's a third world country. So when they increase the pay and stuff like that, it directly, uh, correlates to how much you're paying for your coffee that you drink here. Um, taxation levels in different countries that uh, Starbucks is an international corporation. Uh, every new environment or every new economy that they, that they dip their toes into, they have to abide by uh, their different taxation uh, rules and stuff like that. Uh, uh, global recession within recent years has turned people to cheaper alternatives. Not everybody wants to pay $7 for a cup of coffee. But some opportunities is, uh, who here has been to a Starbucks before? Pretty much probably everybody. When you go into a Starbucks, you kind of, you, you see how most of their employees are probably 25 and under. And uh, this is great for the economy as they're, they're, they're helping pump uh, this new environment of young workers and making productive uh, workers. Also, their expansion into uh, new places has been really great, as, as, as Emily was talking about, how China has the most Starbucks now. Um, this is kind of a cool picture. As you can see, it's a map of all the locations that Starbucks is in. I believe they're actually not in Australia anymore, though, but uh, that was kind of a failure for them. But next slide. Uh, the sociocultural analysis. This is kind of a cool picture that I have up here. I know we did a perceptual map earlier in the year with the burger joints, as you can kind of see where Starbucks compares with other companies. An opportunity for them has been an increase in the American middle class within recent years. Is like that's their primary demographic. That's kind of who they go for. Um, I put. Changing values among population is both a threat and an opportunity because um, some like some cultures don't align with with spending that much money on coffee. So it's kind of up to like the experience that you're looking for and how much you're trying to spend. Uh, an influx of independent coffee chains has also kind of hurt them within the last couple of years as people are trying to spend more money locally. Not everybody wants to to spend money at the corporations. Uh, next slide. So for environmental factors that affect Starbucks, in recent years, uh, a lot of big corporations have faced a lot of scrutiny as far as being green or, or their corporate social responsibility and giving back. I think everybody can remember the big movement that, that Starbucks is included with. This is like the main one that I heard about, but uh, how Sea turtles and like plastic straws were getting out into the environment, so they made there's a big push for biodegradable stuff like that. 
Um, Starbucks uses over four billion cups a year, which is pretty alarming. Um, environmental restrictions are becoming more prevalent, and and uh, it kind of it adds more. I mean, it doesn't directly increase like price, but within I think upcoming years, things will be harder and, and, more, and things will be getting more expensive in that department. Um, as I hand it off to Patrick, he'll get into more of like their plans. Um, but Starbucks plans to get rid of plastic cups by 2025 and provide 100 million trees to farmers. Uh, next slide. All right, so as for their objective, as of right now, as mentioned before, they have 15,000 stores nationally, which is double more than their second leading competitor, as well as 33,000 storefronts globally, which gives them the title of the largest coffee chain, chain house in the world, as well as the title, The Giant. They're located in 78 different countries, and with this, they want to open 40,000 new stores by 2030, which is Honestly, it's going to bring it up to about four times more than their next leading competitor, which is pretty large. Target market. For their target market, they want to go with people with high purchasing power. What this means is that they aren't trying to just like have people come in to just like have some coffee, like spend two dollars. No, their their market is someone's going to come in, spend five to ten dollars. They're okay with that. There's no second thoughts. They're okay with spending five to ten dollars every single morning just so that they can have their coffee and caffeine, as well as their college students. I see a Starbucks cup over there. I know a bunch of us raised our hands earlier for our Starbucks today. They are located on 300 different colleges and universities, with two of them being here on our very own NMU campus. For Western culture replication, to launch globally, they first started with Japan. They did a partnership with Sabazi, and that helped them connect with the younger audience that is in Japan because that younger audience wants to recreate the American Western culture. They also create the third place. This is perfect for people with high purchasing power. You often see them working in their cubicles, working in their office positions, or in those sky highs in New York City, as well as those college students that we all are. We all will be done with, hopefully. Oh, oh go ahead. Uh, in that third place, it's gonna be a place where college students can go, or even just workers, where it's not their home, it's not their workplace, but they can still get some work done. They can feel a little bit relaxed. They can listen to music, have a cup of coffee, and just not have to deal with that stress that's created in other environments as well. As for their ethics and sustainability, Starbucks wants to cut their carbon, water, and waste footprint by 50% by the year 2030. How are they gonna do this? They're gonna do this through the Wildlife Fund and Starbucks. These stores are all examples of the greenest stores, which that 30% up there represents the 30% difference that they have on the environment compared to their older brands. They're also introducing the use of reusable cups, which those ones down there are a little bit plastic, but they're bringing up, I don't know if you've guys seen it, I couldn't find a photo of it, but it's like, it, it's not that kind of plastic. Like it's a whole reusable. It's phenomenal. You can use. You can take it home. You can fill up with another drink. You can put in water. Just a bunch of other kind of drinks. They also want to become resource positive. What this means is that they're going to be giving back more than they're taking. And then I'm going to hand it over to it. So product. Um, for the tangible products, they offer a very large variety of coffee, cappuccinos. Um, baked goods like cake pops and um, like breakfast sandwiches and paninis. Um, and then merchandise, like you can go there, buy a cup of uh, like, so you can continue to pour coffee in it. Um, and then intangibles. So it's the experience that they offer. Like um, Patrick said about the third place, they want to be the third place you go away from home and work, um, just so you can relax. And then the customer service there. Like, if you've ever been to a Starbucks, which I'm sure most of you ha have, they um, offer a completely different experience by, like, the energy that the um, workers have. Like, every Starbucks I've been to, they all have been energetic and love to work there, it seems like. 
And then the Pets. They're everywhere. Like, there's three just in Marquette on campus, and then one over in town somewhere. Um, and then they're based in high traffic areas, so they can get as many people as possible to go there. Um, and then you can find them in any store, like vending machines, gas stations, Walmart, they're everywhere. And then mobile apps, you can order online and then go down and just pick it up so you don't have to wait in line. And then another example is, I'm sure all of you have the Get Mobile app, where you can order the Get Mobile app with that one set for cards. And then promotion. Uh, they promote on social media, um, obviously they have a Facebook account, Twitter account, um, Instagram, and then they have ads. Um, and compared to other companies, um, that Starbucks doesn't spend that much money on advertising stuff. Like, they're pretty cheap with it. And then word to mouth marketing, um, people just like to talk about Starbucks because everyone enjoys it. And then sales promotions, they have like happy hours, for example. Yeah. So they use a premium pricing strategy. Um, this strategy um, takes advantage of people's behavior tendencies. People like to be seen with expensive things, and Starbucks is known to be expensive. So that's why they use that. And then they have an upscale image, so high quality, relating back to the up our premium pricing strategy. It's just people like to be seen with expensive things. And then there's some prices. I did the SWOT analysis, and for the first SWOT analysis, I said that the ranking for the industry is number one, like um, Patrick had said, that they are the number one in the industry for the food, uh, with coffee and coffee by itself, making it the biggest chain for coffee you know, worldwide, meaning that it also has been competing for uh, around over a decade, of about 16 years, with uh, it competing against other different brands uh, such as Big B and Dunkin' Donut. And it is also the third largest American corporation for food and beverages in the world. Um, it is also a $4 billion company, uh, making it outstand, stand out more to a lot of other big coffee places, such as Dunkin', since they are around a not, I don't even say they are worth even a billion yet. Um, making them a bigger company to compete against and harder to challenge. Um, and it also, like you said before, they have around 33,000 stores and the second competing com, uh, company would be Dunkin' Donut with only around 11,000 stores. Uh, the weakness for um, Starbucks would have to be prices. Prices are one of the biggest things that people have to deal with customer-wise, since you can go to a McDonald's and you can get a coffee uh, for about one to two dollars and not have to pay as much, but people have high trust and high expectations for Starbucks, so they're more likely to go there even though they're gonna spend around six to seven dollars on a coffee. Um, and prices as well as the coffee bean is also really expensive. Um, and, uh, and I think it's Arabica. It's like a really big um, coffee bean producing company. And um, this year they started at around $1.30 per, like, uh, for coffee beans. And then it's closer towards where we're at right now. The price has gone up about 74 to 75% increasing to uh, $2.45. Uh, opportunities, uh, energy drinks. I don't know if many of you guys have seen it, but in um, Cat Tracks, they have the new Starbucks energy drink called uh, Baya. Uh, this is a big opportunity for Starbucks since they're able to branch out from not only just coffee, but to things such as energy drinks. And I also thought it would be a good idea for them to collab with maybe other energy drink companies to make different kinds of flavors and different designs with their cans. And threats. Uh, like I said before, the coffee bean is the biggest resource for
for Starbucks. So since having to buy um, a mass production amount of coffee beans, it's going to cost way more. And since they want to open up more stores, around 40,000, like Patrick said, uh, it's going to want to increase the amount that the company itself has to spend, making it a bigger threat. And also other coffee houses introducing different new ideas and different coffees and maybe even coming up with stuff like they did for Opportunity Wise with uh, energy drinks and competing with Starbucks and making it harder to challenge. As for their, our case study, we chose to do Dunkin' Donuts. The reason for this is Dunkin' Donuts is the second leading coffee house chain in the nation. Uh, they're founded in Massachusetts in 1950. They have 11,500 stores within the nation, which is, to put this into perspective, Starbucks, one decade ago, only had 7,000 stores in the nation. Now they have 15. They have, or, or 11,000 in the globe, I'm sorry, 8,000 in the nation. And their target market's gonna be ages around 15 to 45. They like that student, the college students, the high school students, because people are age, a bunch of us are drinking Starbucks right now, we're drinking caffeine, we're drinking energy drinks. Like, we, we need that to get through our days sometimes. We got those long days, we got those late nights. We, we got a lot of classwork, we got a lot of practicing if you're a student athlete. And then for the working class, it's for those people that are buying Starbucks but just can't really afford that benchmark that Starbucks has. So they kind of, their prices go from about a small coffee in Dunkin' Donuts is gonna be 129, as a small coffee at Starbucks is gonna be 429. $3 difference, it's a lot when you're talking about the same size cup. And then they have tremendous social media, so Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, they're phenomenal with it. They love the, they love, they love the trends that are going on. So back in like 2013, 2014, I don't know if any of you remember it, but there was a dress trending on Twitter. It was gold or white or blue and black. So Duncan's response to this was, they made some donuts. Um, and then as well with TikTok, they have reached out to multiple influencers, multiple brands, and recently as of 2021, they did a partnership with Charlie D'Amelio creating the Charlie, which went absolutely berserks with the younger audience and all those 12 year olds that are trying to be just like their favorite influencer star. However, their cons compared to Starbucks is that they're not as reputable. When you think to Starbucks, that, that's the name in coffee. Like no one else questions it. They're like, that's some good coffee right there. So Krispy Kreme, they're in that competition with the donut aspect. And it's crazy to think that a dozen donuts, a Dunkin' Donuts is gonna cost you $14.99 where Krispy Kreme is gonna cost you $7.99. In fact, even half a dozen donuts at Dunkin' Donuts is still gonna cost you $8.50, which is more expensive. And both of those brands are located northeast, like that is their base. And then 7-Eleven, it's kind of that cheaper coffee that is able to put up with the prices that Dunkin' has. They're about that $1, $2 coffee prices. And basically, Dunkin' Donuts, they're trying to work to the status of Starbucks, but Starbucks just has created that, re that reputable, that notable name that Netflix has, or that all those large powerhouse brands that also share the nickname, the giant, just get to own. Those are our excited.